expert Freud, and we're going to talk about Freud and psychoanalysis today. Uh, my goodness, it's, there's so much to share with you about this topic that it's difficult to know where to begin. Um, so where I think uh, is a good idea to begin is just by recreating our little paradigm dialectic of history, just to, again, I'm going to go through this very quickly this time, but I'm going to do this at the beginning of each session now. When I do the 15-week course, you know, three hours a week lecture course, uh, we do this every single class because it helps you to, the repetition, to, to sear it into your mind. So if you remember in the beginning, we have Wundt in Europe with voluntarism. Hopefully you know where I'm going next with this. This the dominant paradigm, the dominant way of doing psychology in Europe. Simultaneously, this is around 1875, simultaneously in the United States, we have William James. Hopefully you, you remember this. William James eventually comes to call his philosophy, his way of doing psychology, pragmatism. There are a few different names, radical empiricism. William James, same time in the US. And as we've mentioned in the past, simultaneously outside of academics, outside of the university, these are both Leipzig, University of Leipzig, Harvard University, these are both entrenched in the academic uh, system of college, when I say academic. On the outside of this, there's another guy doing something that he's referring to as psychology, but it's very foreign and very different from what's going on in academic psychology, and that is Freud and psychoanalysis. So we're going to put down here Freud and psychoanalysis. Freud and psychoanalysis exist to this day. They're still, as we're going to learn today, still psychoanal psychoanalysts, psychoanalytic institutes, psychoanalytic therapists. Wundt's voluntarism and William James' pragmatism becomes eclipsed in America at Cornell University by a guy who got his PhD from Wundt named Edward Titchener. And Edward Titchener does something called structuralism. He says that this is Wundtian psychology, but in fact, it's not Wundt's psychology. Wundt was interested in how the mind actively organizes things into a meaning for each meaning, whereas Titchener was looking at structuralism, the structural consciousness, consciousness, but both of these guys are still looking at largely consciousness. And it's not until the end of Wundt's career, when he writes the Volcker psychology, that he really steps away from uh, the idea that laboratory psychology or experimental academic psychology can study things of, a, of, a, of higher intellectual process. Remember Volcker psychology, his text, his 10 volume text says, we better leave this to philosophy, anthropology, theology, to study the higher psychological processes. In the United States, a new, what we'll study next week in 1913, a new paradigm comes about called behaviorism. This is reward and punishment, John D. Watson. Reward and punishment psychology. And from 1913 until the 1960s, this is the dominant way of doing psychology. Reward and punishment schedules eventually, uh, cla I'm sorry, classical conditioning, and then eventually um, P.F. Skinner and reward and punishment schedules. And then eventually we have something called a cognitive revolution. And this cognitive revolution happens in the early 1960s. And this has been the dominant paradigm 
through this day in psychology, it's only in the past decade that we've seen something called neuroscience take place. And so we might call that the new paradigm, the newest paradigm, neuroscience. But you know, the cognitive psychologists like to watch themselves on this movement by calling themselves cognitive neuroscientists. Before this, the behaviorists wanted to latch themselves on the cognitive psychology by calling themselves cognitive behaviorists. You know, it's what happens when you get a PhD 20 years earlier, and now the psychology has moved on to something else, and you want to make yourself relevant. You start renaming the thing you're doing. Uh, you'll find today cognitive neuroscience. You'll find neuro everything. So anybody who wants to suddenly become legitimate in what they're doing, call themselves a neuro. <laughs> Neurolinguist, neurosociologist, neuroeconomist, name it, it's out there. And they're latching on to the uber modern of neuroscience. Meanwhile, if you recall last week's thing, there was this force that found behaviorism to be uh, myopic, meaning narrow minded, narrow vision, uh, myopic, um, shallow. It found Freud and this stuff to be not academic enough, not laboratory, invest, not experimental enough. And they called themselves Gestalt psychologists, the Gestaltists. And they never, like psychoanalysis, they never become like this strong dominant, dominant paradigm, but they become a big influence in the history of psychology. After next week, we're going to talk about this group of people called third force psychology. They were neither behaviorists, I'm sorry, they were neither behaviorists or psychoanalysts, and they were called humanists. Also called existential phenomenological psychology. But well, we get to them, I think, in two weeks' time, the pen, penultimate lecture, and then the cognitive that we did the last lecture. So I'm home straight. So we're going to take a look today at Freud and psychoanalysis. Are there any questions about this chart that hopefully doesn't look <laughs> new to anyone? Because this is probably about the fifth time now that I've drawn this. And I'm going to draw it again for the next two lectures because I want you to have this, like I said, hand seared into your mind. Where are the nice things to erase? Oh, wow, thank you so much. I'm going to grab that. That's definitely thank you very much. Questions or thoughts about this? Do you all recall that way back in the beginning, 10 weeks ago, uh, <laughs> right? It's 10, only 10 hours ago. Way back in the beginning, when we did this this kind of graph that showed psychogenic and psychogenesis and biogenesis, biological causation and psychological causation, and how they flip flopped to different periods of time. We talked about antiquity, ancient Greece, ancient Rome. We talked about um, the Renaissance period, medieval period, the Renaissance period, the classical period. The Romantic period, and then finally the 20th century, now the 21st century, and we showed how these tendencies to the predominant Weltanschauung, or the, the predominant way of thinking about psychology in academics, flip flopped between biological causes, looking at things that we today call neuroscience or biological psychology, flip flopping with psychological causes, or psychological phenomena such as cognitive psychology, thinking. And we saw that through history, these two uh, flip-flopped back and forth, and we made a prediction that we were on the cusp of a new psychogenic era. Um, perhaps that's what's coming next after the, the fad of neuroscience. Boy, oh boy, what an offensive thing. I guess neuroscientists would be very offended to hear a historian call this a fad. But I've studied enough history of psychology and also have now been in this teaching psychology for 20 years, but I have seen fads come and go. And I'm beginning to see the neuroscience cracks in the big neuroscience. We, we get a new idea and we think, oh, this is going to be uh, the, 
panacea. This is going to solve all our problems, this new model. In the 1960s, as we'll find out, it was a computer model, cognitive psychology. Before that, it was behaviorism. Well, if we look at that 19th century, that 1800s, so whenever you hear 19th century, think 1800s. When you hear 18th century, think 1700s. When you hear 20th century, 1900s. Were you all born in the 21st century? Am I the only 20th century uh, child here? Yeah, I was born in 2001. I was born in 1984. So we're 20th century beings <laughs> amongst the 21st century folks. So when we think of the 19th century, we think the 1800s. And the 19th century is very interesting. Something very interesting takes place. I'm going to erase this and just recreate something for you. So I want to set, I want to describe the soil out of which psychoanalysis comes out. In the 19th century, we call this the Romantic period in art. Do remember, 19th century, the 1800s, and we call this the Romantic period. The Romantic period, because it started to on emotion once again. Whereas the classical period was all about scientific logic and mathematical accuracy and models of rational thinking, the Romantic period said, okay, we've taken that as far as we can. Now we want to look into the emotions. We started to get people like Goethe. Spelled Goethe. Looks like Goethe is pronounced Goethe. Goethe is one of the most incredible Renaissance men. Science thinker. He did everything. He thought about poetry and literature and science and psychology. Goethe turns out, I mentioned him because he's a big influence on Freud. We also have, uh, at the same time, if you remember, you had these, you had a, a, a biogenic, in the classical period, biogenic was up here and psychogenic. Just talked about this. Was so biogenic was. Uh, I'm sorry. The psychogenic was at a low, and the biogenic was at a high in the 18th century. And right here at the, the 19th century, you started to have. Why am I having trouble drawing this? Right here in the 20th and the 19th century, we had this kind of crisis moment between biogenic and psychogenic, whichever one you want to put up here. Bio, biological causation was very strong in the, 18th, under, in the 18th century. And during the 19th century, you had this kind of moment of these crossovers where biological theory of causation and psychological theory of causation came to almost like an equal footing. There were people like Wundt who were really looking at biogenic experimental kind of stuff. And the physiologists and Helmholtz, et cetera, these people. And then on the flip side, you had people like Goethe and Schopenhauer and Nietzsche who were looking at more psychological or psychological causation. And we have this moment right here where the biogenic and the psychogenic kind of collide. And what I want you, or what I'd like to propose to you is, it's out of this collision that Freud arises. That Freud comes out of the soil of this collision between the biogenic and the psychogenic. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because Sigmund Freud was not an academically trained psychologist. He didn't come out of the lab at Berlin or at Leipzig or Wundt or any of the other German psychology, lab psychology, that focused on what they were calling experimentation. Freud came out of medical school. If you go to medical school, your undergraduate degree is pre-med, which is what? Biology studies. It's very biologically based med medicine. So Freud, come, Freud is actually one of the first individuals to sketch nerve, neural tissue, to make, neuro, to make sketches of the, neuro, the, the neuron under a microscope. He also, as a biologist, 
He wanted to actually be a biology professor, uh, but he fell in love, and his advisor said, if you want to make a living that you can support a family, at that time, a college professor was something that the college, it was usually something done by a bachelor, it was male dominated in Germany at the time. You've got the men who lived on campus, like William James, or on campus or near campus, and devoted their life to being an academic. And had university housing. He said, oh, well, some universities still give you housing. If you teach at NYU, you get an apartment. He's like, well, I'm below Washington Square Park, which is the kind of good perk <laughs> in Manhattan apartment prices. Nevertheless, Freud wanted to have it. He fell in love, in love with him. And his advisor said, being a biology professor isn't what you're doing. And Freud changed his focus to medicine. And he studied and became family practitioner, family practice doctor. Specializing in neurology, which was his interest. He actually even developed the, uh, do you know when you look through a microscope lens and the, the cells that you look at are when you get prepared slides or if you're preparing the slide yourself, if you do the dissection and you put the, the specimen on the slide, you have to put dye in the slide to make it color. Freud's the guy who developed that technique of putting dye in to cells. He studied the biology of eels famously. He actually cracked the mystery of the sexuality of eels, how eels reproduce. Freud was a strong biologist. He called himself, from the beginning to the end of his life, a scientist. Freud also knew there were limitations in biology when it came to the human condition. If Wundt was a laboratory academic psychologist, we can use Freud's word, own words to describe what he thought of what he was doing. Well, once he got into medicine and decided to begin looking at the psychology of people, of ill people, people with what we today call schizophrenia or converse somatoform disorders, so hysteria and conversion disorder, symptoms converting into physical, I'm sorry, psychological pain manifesting in physical symptoms, a rash or blindness or a paralysis or something like this, or pains in the body, so that's conversion disorder. Hysteria would be things like what we today would call schizophrenia, so hallucinations and delusions and things like that. that have no physical cause but have some sort of cause rooted in the person's experiential past. Freud, once he became interested in this stuff, did not refer to him, did not view himself, he did refer to himself as a scientist, but he viewed himself not as a laboratory scientist, but as a conquistador. A conquistador is an explorer, someone who's there to conquer. He viewed himself almost like, do you remember the old Indiana Jones films? You remember these Indiana, have you ever seen Indiana Jones? Yes, I have. They're, they're fun to watch. No, they were, these, this is what was popular when I was, you know, adolescent. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Well, Indiana Jones was an archaeologist. He went to foreign lands and explored this mysterious darkness of the unknown civilizations, you know? And that's what Freud was doing. Freud, as a matter of fact, described the psychoanalytic venture, this thing that he was developing, as an archaeology, that he was actually excavating under the ground, under consciousness, awareness, into unseen, hidden, buried aspects of the, the individual. So Freud, although referred to himself as a scientist, he really likened himself, what would we say, kind of spiritually, as, as an archaeologist, a conquistador, an explorer. And he really thought of himself in this kind of Indiana Jones-like fashion. And he was also very, very much concerned with something called fame. He wanted to be famous. He craved to be known. Maybe this is the thing that both was his, his serum. It was both his the thing that made him so successful and also the thing that poisoned him it was the desire for fame. He had that desire for notoriety, that desire for fame, that desire to be recognized, and it's somehow very deep within him. Keep in mind, Freud was an, was born in Moravia, he was Moravian, uh, what we today eventually call Austria, 
He's not German. He speaks German, but he's Austrian. Spent most of his life in Vienna, Austria, until the Nazi came and tried to kill him and he escaped. He was with his family and moved to London for around, I think, two years of his life, one or two years of his life. Um, Freud was a secular Jew. So he was Jewish by birth. He was Jewish by tradition, but he was not Jewish by faith. But as any of you in here have grown up in a certain religious tradition that maybe you no longer follow, maybe you've decided that you're an atheist or that at least an agnostic or you have no use for this religion that you grew up indoctrinated with. Like John Steinbeck says, somehow when you're born and you're put into a little uh, crucible, a little box, a Protestant box, kind of like a little chick growing up in egg, you take on the form of that Protestantism, the form of that Judaism. For me, I took on the form of Catholicism because I grew up deeply going to mass every week, going to Catholic school. Uh, you know, the, the guilt of, oh, <laughs> that comes along with anyone who knows Catholicism knows this. Now, like Freud, at this point, in, at some point in my life, I could have no longer practiced or believed in Catholicism, but Catholicism is intimately part of my view, and specifically Italian Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, which is very different from, say, Irish Catholicism. And it's really different if you go hang out in Haiti for a little while and go to a Roman Catholic service in Haiti, you'll see voodoo. <laughs> um, Catholicism takes on the tra has traditionally taken on the trait of the culture. Freud, this is the kind of Jew Freud was. But he grew up in a Christian, a do Christian dominated culture as an outsider. And he this is where these kernels of wanting to be something, wanting to prove to the world that a Jew could be a great man is actually one of the things he, he said in, in a letter. So this, later there's a, 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 an affiliate in Austria named Alfred Adler, who's also, I mean, well, he wasn't a student of Freud's, but he was part of Freud's circle. And Alfred Adler, if you'll recall from your theories of personalities class, said something very interesting. He said that, if you want to understand someone's behavior for your own behavior, the first question to ask is, how does my doing this help me to overcome feelings of inferiority? Adler said that at the, at the, at the core of all of us, we have an intense feeling of insecurity, of inferiority, that we're not good enough, that other people are better than us, that we don't deserve to be here. And we might even, Alice Miller, a psychoanalyst from, Polish, a psychoanalyst from Switzerland, it's said, we actually go through life having deep resentment for our parents for bringing us into this situation when we didn't ask to even be here. <laughs> and those, we might not be consciously aware of this resentment, but somewhere deep in us, we want to punish our parents for bringing us into this and you know, us having to take responsibility and be in this sense. So if you think of this in these terms, at the core of Freud, if we want to psychoanalyze Freud, we have an individual who was kind of had this feeling of persecution and a feeling of, of wanting to prove to the world that a, a Jewish man could be a powerful man. And at the same time, he has a mother who treats him like the golden apple, the golden, my golden-haired Ziggy, is what his mom called him. His mom was very young. His father, I think, was about 20 years older than the mother. And Freud was part of a, grew up part of a big family, but he was the chosen one. When Freud's sister started taking piano lessons and it interfered with Freud's studying as a little boy, seven, eight years old, piano lessons ended for the child, for the sister. Freud was the favorite one. And Freud was remarkably brilliant. He was fluid, fluent, fluent, both, in ancient Greek by the time he was 12 years old. He had studied ancient Greek mythology he had studied biology. He had studied all these things. He was a gifted child. The Germans, to this day, my, my um, dissertation advisor is a German philosophy professor. And he once mentioned in our class that the two most revered individuals in German writing are Goethe, in, as far as being the greatest of German literature, and Freud. We don't typically think of Freud as a literary figure. Freud is regarded as one of the most elegant and eloquent 
German writers who have lived. So, good. so Freud had it kind of like, you could view this as this kind of like something to do. And he wanted to stick it. Maybe we can all identify this. Maybe we think back to our high school years or something like this. And, and maybe we, uh, some, every once in a while, maybe that might be the thing that drives us on to do something to say, see, proved you wrong. <laughs> I actually am worthwhile. Or, in a more psychoanalytic way, maybe that's what we're at some level telling our mom and our dad, see, you were wrong. Freud said that we fall in love. We fall in love with someone. It's actually proving our parents wrong. See, I am, in fact, lovable. One thing we'll find about Freud is all the, all the rationalist terms upside down is we approach everything paradoxically. So this is why I say that Freud comes out of this this situation of the biological, being trained as a biological scientist, as a physician, and yet this other dynamic, rich, philosophical world of Goethe, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Judaism. If I show you a slide here, will it happen? Look at these things I put together here. Each of these are clickable and you can read these or watch these on your own. But we have here Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche. During this period, he famously said, God is dead and we have killed him. He has the madman run into the street and saying, God is dead, we have killed him. Now what shall we do? God is dead and we have killed him. People laugh at him say, go away. You're nuts. God is dead. And he, he finally, after a whole day of this, he turns and looks at everyone and he says, they're not ready for me. I've come too soon. And he goes back up into his cave. People don't know. People misread this. And thought, of course, Nietzsche was an atheist, but that's not what Nietzsche was talking about. What Nietzsche was talking about when he said, God is dead and we've killed him, was the fact that science, scientific endeavors and scientific psychology had become so strong that people of the 19th century did away with God. They killed off God. No longer needed God because now science will answer the questions we need. Science will help us to overcome the issues. Science and laboratories and academics will help us to understand the psyche. And what Nietzsche was saying here was, watch what you do. They don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because religion and belief in something that is beyond the measurable and the observable might be more important to the human condition than you realize, and what are you going to replace it with once you throw it out? And the people are laughing at the madman in the square that Nietzsche wrote about, not because he was saying that God didn't exist, but they were saying, of course God doesn't exist. We already know that. What? <laughs> What's your point? And we don't need the concept of God. That's what they were saying. He said, I'm too soon, because the people hadn't realized yet the crisis of what happens once you take the unobservable, the unmeasurable, out of the equation of the human condition. Now, Freud's reading, um, let me back, back up. Freud claims he never read Nietzsche. As a matter of fact, Freud wrote in, in one of his final papers that he intentionally avoided reading Nietzsche because the ideas that Nietzsche had about the mind and about how to go about analyzing the mind were so similar to his own that he didn't want Nietzsche's ideas to interfere with his own ideas. I will tell you that I find this to be very unlikely. I think when in Freud, Nietzsche's writings were and are, exist yet to this day in Freud's library. He had Nietzsche's writings, and I have also found instances where he talks about Nietzsche and Nietzsche's ideas in his writings. I find it very unlikely that Freud would have ignored Nietzsche out of not wanting to, I think Freud wanted as many ideas as he could get to rehash and present in his own way. So when you think about Freud, I would suggest you strongly read him to Nietzsche. Now, I, I posted a movie on the, the Moodle for you to watch if you're interested in these things, and it's uh, right here. It's called When Nietzsche Wept, and I found it a free I found a free uh, link to it. It's, it's a book by Irvin Yalom, an existential psychologist who's now he has cancer and he's 
on his final descent. <laughs> He's going into the next realm. But uh, if uh, you click on this somehow, well, it didn't connect, but somehow you can look this up. I'll try to, I don't know why it's not working, but this film, When Nietzsche Wept, is a fictional story. Now, it's important that if you watch this, you keep in mind this is dreamed up by Irving Yala, which is going to psychoanalyst. If this is a story that Yala imagines in his mind about how Nietzsche influenced Freud. And I think it's a, it gives you, at least if nothing else, the strong memory and impression that Nietzsche's writings are very similar to Freud's writings and his ideas. So a lot of what you read in Freud comes from Nietzsche, or may I say at least it can be found in Nietzsche. According to Freud, he just thought of it independently on his own. So we have, I'll fix this link for you. It's a great film, so it's fun to watch. Uh, so there we have the Nietzsche. Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, a, not a German philosopher like Nietzsche. Uh, Schopenhauer is, if you study psychoanalysis, Schopenhauer is a big part of your study. So I think my master's degree and my PhD in psychodynamic psychology. And in both of those things, we have constant and constant with Schopenhauer. My dissertation advisor is, is uh, one of the world's leading Schopenhauer scholars. So we have, I just came across lecture, my lecture notes from one of his seminars. And I, the thing that struck me the most about this is a Schopenhauer seminar. Schumacher in 2007 or something like this, 2006. And as you know, your syllabus that you get, this is European size style syllabus. You know how your syllabus has pages and pages spelling everything out? And this, this syllabus is great. It's old school. I wish you could experience how refreshing life was back then. It's one sheet of paper. It has his name, the name of the course, the dates we'll be doing what things, and the books to read, and that's it. If there was no, if you don't do this, you'll get this, and if you don't do this, you'll get this, you just, if you didn't come to the lecture, you were fired. You got kicked out of the school, you know. If you didn't turn in your assignment, you were fired from the school. Whole different world, you know, and this was only 20 years ago. Um, but and today, the syllabus I've seen, you know, has all the legal documentation, all the things you have to say if you do this, you don't do this. This was a different mentality back not too long ago in school. Uh, it's interesting. So that show that stuck out of my mind this weekend when I found that folder, how much your classroom setting has changed. Well, Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, you, I tell you, go and read sections of Schopenhauer, and you'll think it's Freud. Schopenhauer talks about the unconscious. He talks about denial. He talks about repression. He talks about what Freud called defense mechanisms. Everything, almost everything you find in Freud, you find in Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, Freud does acknowledge. Freud makes it very clear that he's read Schopenhauer, but for some reason, he keeps the Nietzsche question, he keeps that as a mystery. And I, I, my money would bank on Freud read Nietzsche. What else do we have here? Some things you might not, oh, Greek mythology, of course. You remember we studied Plato? Freud not only read Plato, but read Plato in ancient Greek which is very different than reading Plato in English or German. Freud, uh, if you remember, took the, a lot of Platonic ideas, such as Book 7 of the Republic, with the structure of the charioteer with the lascivious horse and the self-righteous horse and the charioteer trying to manage the path of this, where this chariot go, goes because one horse wants to satisfy its desire and the other horse wants to satisfy its self-righteous indignation. And that, of course, comes from Plato. And this, of course, is the, one of the places where Freud gets this idea of the, this eye, this upper, the uber, the over eye, and the, the id process. So ancient Greek mythology is another big one. We could add to this list with ancient Greek mythology, you can add to this archaeology, but this is more intellectual in choices. Now, a big one that folks overlook, and you may not ever encounter again, but I urge you to look into it, is the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. 
So you may have heard of Kabbalah or Kabbalah, and this is the idea in Judaism that you take the text and you look for symbolic, not literal meanings in the text. So maybe some of you who have grown up, if, if you've grown up in a Christian tradition, you may realize that different Christian sects take different approaches to the text. There are some literalists, they're called in theology, who see 6,000 years the world took to create, and it means 6,000 years. There are other individuals who are not literalists who see this as analogy, symbolism, metaphor. So the idea, it's a long time. They don't literally take that there's a talking serpent, but it's a metaphor. So Freud takes this idea of the mysticism of Judaism. In, in Christianity, there's something called Gnosticism. This is Christian mysticism. In Islam, does anyone know the mystical sect of Islam? Do you know what it's called? They have the dervishes who swirl, swirl around like this until they're into ecstasy. Is it like Sufism? Sufism. 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 That's good. Good memory. So Islamic mysticism is Sufism. Sufism. So we have mystical Judaism. Kabbalah. I put a... In Kabbalah, you find something like this. You find this discussion, not literal, but metaphorical, of the Genesis, the garden story. What do you have in this story? You have this thing, tree. <laughs> you have this guy. And you have this situation. the abstract artist apparently. And then you have this thing, you know, and then, and then you have this up here. The celestial dictator. You have the, the eye in the sky. Wagging the finger. And then this serpent. What is this all about? Well, in Kabbalah and in mystical Judaism, you don't literally you talk about fruit and serpents. You talk about, what is this? Desire. This is desire. You have the masculine and the feminine that exists in all of us when we teach this. The animus and the animal. That's later, not Freud, but Jung. But you have a masculine and a feminine in mystical Judaism. That's in, in all of us. Now this doesn't, don't get caught up in Century gender stuff. This means masculine and feminine, again, is not literal. It is metaphorical. Metaphorical, masculine in this historical setting, in this time period, is seen as what? Maybe logical, maybe as we see Adam as the logical figure, the one who resists temptation, and we see the female, the Adma, perhaps, as the one who succumbs to temptation, or is for self-temptation for the male point of view. This is 1800s, remember, not 20,000. So then we have this tree. What's this tree called? What is, the, what is this tree in the story? The tree of wisdom, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? It's the tree of wisdom, the tree of knowledge. You treat, you eat this apple, your desire, if you bite this, what's the promise? It's desire. The great promise is that you yourself will be God. You will possess the knowledge of God. And you have this eye in the sky. Well, we can easily dissect this mysticism into what? Desire? What is Freud? What is this known as in psychoanalysis? This, the id. The desirous id. Adam and Eve, the masculine and feminine. This is us, the ego. Ego is Latin for I, myself, me. And what's the eye in the sky? The celestial dictator watching to see who's right and wrong. You know what it is? The uber ick, the above eye, the super ego in the Latin. The super ego. This is just one example to show you when you look at mystical Judaism, the rabbinical literature, 
this rabbinical study, especially in mysticism, is not taking literal interpretations of things. It's looking at things poetically, metaphorically, symbolically. Exactly where we end up with Freud in dream analysis. Freud takes from this the idea that the, the unconscious, this thing called the unconscious, is communicates in symbolism, communicates in not in measurable and observable rational ways, but communicates in irrational symbolic language of the emotion. So when we look at Freud and psychoanalysis, keep these things in mind. These are the kind of psychogenic. Any questions or thoughts on this yet? Anything? So we have this One further thing I want to remind you of is the distinction for the distinction for uh, if we look up here, I use this pointer here. You know, Kantian split. We have continental philosophy here and analytical philosophy. Don't confuse analytical philosophy with psychoanalysis. Analytical psychology are actually the opposite. So if you remember, analytical philosophy was logic based on mathematical models, ex laboratory experimentation, logic, that stuff. The stuff that Wundt was trained in, academic stuff. And the continental philosophers, these are people like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, many of which, who, if they did teach in university, they quit. Nietzsche quit university. He was the youngest tenured professor in the University of Basel in Switzerland. And he wrote a letter, which I love, that says, the last place you want to go if you want to think is the university. And he quit. Why? Because he got tired of going to meetings. And all his colleagues were interested in, in advancement, and career, and titles, and uh, what do you call these things? Committee meetings. I've met as this has turned me off about academics, too. Spent five years in that system. And, and I see that all my time was soaked up in being on a committee meeting, eating cookies and brownies. I said, ah. Think I don't need this, so I left and I went to the coffee house, just like Nietzsche did. Dropped out of it. Sartre did. I didn't get it. That's the hallmark of continental philosophy. Continental philosophy largely operates outside, outside of, of university systems. Independent academics who might be making their living as a bartender, or teaching as an itinerant professor, or something like this. You know, who doesn't get involved, but gets the milk and honey, but stays clean of it, and so they can write books and think. It's largely continental philosophy is all about. It's about the irrational. It's about the emotional, not fixating itself on logic and experimentation and mathematics. If you remember, I had mentioned to you a few months, weeks ago, that out of analytic tradition came experimental psychology, Wundt and Leipzig and James. Actually, James is down here. It's another story. But the, out of continental philosophy is Freud. Freud is steeped in Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and Jewish mysticism. So Freud's coming out of a different stream. I posted an article on the Moodle page in 2007, and I would love for you to take a moment and, and read it, because it's so good. It's from the New York Times. Look what this is called. Freud is widely taught at universities except in the psychology department. And I want to try to, now that I've kind of like, I want to try to demystify this for you, what, what this is all about. Academic psychology is rooted in that laboratory tradition. It's rooted in study of consciousness. Freud extended things beyond the study of consciousness to the study of the unconscious. It's not until the late 20th century, in my time, and you all know this term, that this old wine and new bottle starts to appear by the cognitive psychologists. And they start talking about implicit memory and implicit knowledge. And all the same, well, this is, it sounds kind of funny. The Harvard Implicit Lab is looking at reaction times to how you respond to words. And we think, my goodness, this is the technique Carl Jung developed. And we all say, boy, this isn't as remarkable as people are making it out to be. It's old ideas being represented in, in new terms. I hear implicit 
knowledge and I think unconscious. It's an identical thing. One exists in the academic laboratory system. The other exists outside the academic uh, laboratory system. Freud and psychoanalysis today is this study in 2007, and I'll say it's even more so today, I would argue, um, where you find Freud is in cinema studies, in women's studies, in art studies, in literature studies, these, in, in um, anthropology. You go to those majors and you talk about psychoanalysis, you'll find psychoanalysis of art, psychoanalysis of literature, psychoanalysis of gender, psychoanalysis of all this stuff. They are much more comfortable with Freud in those disciplines. In psychology, especially in undergraduate level, not so much so. In an undergraduate department, depending on the size of your school, if you have five full-time psychology faculty members, you might have a mix between therapists, therapeutic-oriented psychologists, and research activity psychologists. If your department's really big, you'll have a good representation, a mixed representation. If it's real small, you might have only therapists, therapeutic psychologists, or only experimental psychologists. Typically, you don't get experimental psychologists because they don't have labs, and middle colleges don't have labs. But it could be. So what you have is you'll have uh, a course like theories of personality, where you're learning all the scientific stuff, the trait theory and all this stuff. And then you also study Freud and Jung and Adler and, and Eric Fromm and people like this, Karen Hornai. You say, how does this fit in with any of this? And if, you, if the person teaching that class tends to be a cognitive psychologist or an experimental cognitive psychologist, they're going to talk about it with a kind of condescension. Oh, this is something that's unverifiable. It's not really scientific. It's not really, it's something that's part of history now. And in fact, if you go to another department, such as literature or film studies or media studies or any of those philosophy, you will find that Freud and psychoanalytic thinking is a big part of it. The question is why? And I'll answer the question very simply for you. You're talking about the difference between disciplines that view themselves as humanities, the human side, humanities, you know, like philosophy is a humanities, literature is a humanities, film studies is a humanities. Now you have psychology. Most psychology departments aren't considered in the humanities, they're considered in sciences. Even if traditionally, I don't know what it is, I would like to assess that it could be like liberal arts or something like this, it's called like arts and sciences. But most of psychologists today view themselves as scientists the way a chemist is a scientist or a biologist is a scientist. And they seek to live up to that kind of idea of science. So we have here is the, just the main distinction. And this was a distinction that was made in 1959 by a guy named C.P. Snow. He talked about these two cultures. The book that he wrote is called The Two Cultures from a series of lectures. It's, great to, it's a great read. And what are the two cultures? The two cultures are the humanities and the natural sciences. And then there's catalog sciences, sciences like psychology and sociology who want to be affiliated with the natural sciences. But the physicists and mathematics, mathematicians laugh at this. It's the chemistry folks and biology folks, they say, oh, that's soft science. We're hard science. Another interesting piece of information I just want to throw out there, uh, I got into physics quite a bit. Took a bunch of physics classes, theoretical physics. Even by a very interesting twist in my life, dated for a number of years, the niece of the chair of the physics department at Stanford University, very famous wow. physicist, so I'd be around the holiday table with this guy. We'd be talking about this. This is what the conversations yield. It's unbelievable. What this guy, I, what I realized is what the physicists call science is very liberal compared to what psychologists refer to as science. What goes on in theoretical physics is very different than this thing we're taught, experimental design and psychology. Wow. One case in point, I'll give you this. Would you all consider Albert Einstein to be a scientist? 
course. Do you know how many experiments Albert Einstein conducted in his lifetime? Experiments, control group, experiments, zero. Zero. Every single one of his studies, explorations, came from thought experiments. If I was an individual riding on a, on a beam of light that was traveling at the speed of light, and et cetera, they were all thought experiments that were then worked out with mathematical representation. There was no experiments done. Now keep that in mind when we think about the hallmark of psychological and laboratory psychology today. If we get away with, and if you wanted to get someone published or do something, if you get away in experimentation by doing a thought experiment in psychology, you wouldn't fly. And the, the thing that's amazing to me is Thought experiment seems to be very psychological, the idea of a thought experiment. Freud was very aware of this problem. And what Freud decided to do was to create what he called a new science. It wasn't limited to these observable and measurable logical mathematical models of the conscious psychologist, Freud and Titchener. And it, but it still followed the ideas of science in that it was rigorous and, and logical. So when you hear Freud use the term science, he's not talking about lab science. He's talking about a 19th century idea of science, which is thorough thinking. That's the use of this word. Science in its original form, scientia, means the acquisition of knowledge in Latin, scientia. So when you hear Freud talking about science and calling himself a scientist, what he's saying is that I'm a thorough thinker. I'm investigating things thoroughly. But his information didn't come from laboratory. It came from observing people in his consultation room, observing society. So this idea is that physical science is good for some things and not good for everything. Abraham Maslow may have put it best in his book, The Psychology of Science. He said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And Freud's criticism of laboratory psychology was that it was trying to force human phenomenon, much of which was not measurable, not even observable directly, only symbolically or metaphorically, and trying to squeeze that into the physical science rules. It would be like you're trying to assemble a bookshelf that has screws with a hammer for everything. It's, it'll work, it'll get you together, but it's never quite right. So he wanted to develop what he called a new science. And the new science is one that had the rigor of logical thought, rational logical thought, but it's the, what it studied and how it studied was the irrational and the illogical. How do you study, can you imagine this? You're studying irrational and illogical things in a rational and logical way. And that was his new science. The first thing that he, okay, you can read that on your own. By the way, I just want to also show you this, because this is so timely. Um, I think you're going to really dig this. This, yesterday, or two days ago, this, I printed this out in PDF form because you need the past to get in the New York Times. Not your daddy's Freud. This article that came out in the New York Times just two days ago, March 22nd, I guess it's a few days ago now. Uh, it's all about this resurgence of psychoanalysis. And these, your age, your folks, and a little older are digging Freud, getting back into it. But it's a reinterpreted form. So, for example, if you're interested, you, if you're interested in gender studies or feminist studies, or women's studies, um, there is a very famous theorist named Judith Butler who wrote a, book, a famous book called *Gender Troubles*, a classic in gender studies. Uh, Judith Butler also wrote a book called *Antigone's Claim*. And what she did in this book is rather remarkable. It's a great little read. Once you understand Freudian theory, you can really appreciate this. What um, she wrote about was a psychoanalysis 
that instead of being based on an Oedipal complex, the story of Oedipus, is based on the story of Antigone, which Antigone is the held up as the quintessential feminist story. It's about a woman who has to decide between the command of the king saying, you're not allowed to do something, bury her dead brother, and taking upon herself to bury him and then kill herself. And she writes a psychoanalysis, Freud's ideas, not from Freud out, but from Freud rewriting Freud based on a different concept. There's another individual, Block Edinger, who uh, has a psychoanalytic theory, another psychoanalytic theory, who interprets Freud. And she talks about something called the matrixial border space. What's the matrixial border space? Brock Eminger says there's one thing, possibly, I mean, it's getting a little different today, but there's one thing all of us in here share in common, regardless of anything else, we've all spent nine months or a period of time in a womb <laughs> as prenatal environment. That's the matrixial border space. It's, again, it's a feminist psychoanalysis. That's just to give you an idea. Things. Um, so where do you find this? If, you, if you're interested in psychoanalysis, if you're interested in Freud, if you're interested in the post-Freudians, we typically we talk about psychoanalytic meaning Freud specifically, psychodynamic meaning Freud and the others. Jung would be psychoanalytic, or psychodynamic. Fromm would be psychodynamic. Wilhelm Reich would be psychodynamic. Freud would be psychoanalytic. So that's how you use those two terms, psychoanalytic, psychoanalysis and psychodynamic. So what would you do if, if you're in this situation? Number one, if you've encountered the opinion that Freud is, that psychoanalysis or psychodynamic theory is passe, out of fashion, not relevant, realize that it's probably the source you're hearing this from. They're probably a cognitive psychologist or a neuroscientist or someone who's not interested in psychodynamic theory. If you want to study this stuff in graduate school, go on to the APA website and they have a list of psychodynamic friendly graduate programs. Also keep this in mind. If you're applying for your master's degree in upcoming or already, say you go to you want to go to Columbia University. Don't be afraid to apply there. 88% acceptance rate for their master's program. PhD is another story, but don't let the big names scare you away because master's degree is a cash cow for any department. You want to get you want to admit as many, as many master's degree students in as they can to fund their PhD program. That's the tough one to get in. You only get like maybe four seats in a PhD program at Columbia, but in master's degree, you might have 40 seats. So you'll probably, if your grades are good and you did a good job, you'll probably get in. So don't hold back, shoot for it. If you don't get in, then who cares? Go somewhere else. But that being said, if you want to study graduate school in, in Columbia University, if you want to be a laboratory psychologist, you know, in this Wontian, Jamesian, Tichnerian, behaviors, cognitive psychology tradition, you apply to Columbia University Graduate School of Psychology, lab psychology. If you want to study therapy, the therapy program is a completely different program. As a matter of fact, it's in the Teachers College of Columbia University. You get a master's in education or an EDD, an educational doctorate. These two departments have nothing to do with each other. The, math, the, 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 it's psychology, the talk therapy department is very strong very strong psychodynamic influence. You can seek that out. NYU, you can become a psychoanalyst at NYU. You can become a psychoanalyst through Columbia as well. You can be, um, you go to the new school. Now here's a little piece of information I was going to wrap up with. When I went and did my master's degree in psych concentration in psychoanalysis at the New School for Social Research, the concentration was in Freud, Jung, Adler, and a guy named Wilhelm Reich. He was a famous Reich now, when I got my master's degree there, about two years afterwards, they switched the psychoanalysis concentration from the psychology department to the philosophy department. So if you go onto the website of the New School for Social Research, type in psychoanalytic studies, you'll find it's no longer in the psychology department. It's a concentration in the philosophy department. That's very interesting, and it holds true to this article that we're seeing. The reason for this is there Therapy concentration in master's degree is still strongly psychoanalytic. That's true. It's also very Buddhist psychology.
But as far as um, theor theoretical, so you can get this degree and like you can do things like be a film critic or an art critic or you know write for more intellectually oriented reviews and stuff like this. Not if it's a good movie and this was the plot, but more intellectually, you know, digging into stuff like the New York Times or Rubbish. The interesting thing that you have to keep in mind is that this concentration in, in Freud is found mostly in departments outside of psychology or in graduate school in in counseling or, or psych, psych, psychiatric or um, clinical programs, not in research psychology. If you want to do research from a psychodynamic perspective, so in other words, psych, the psychology of cinema or culture, like Eric Fromm did, um, then you have to go someplace and get a theoretical when I wanted to pursue my studies in psychodynamic cultural theory, I had to go to Switzerland to do it. And I did, my degree is actually in media and communications. You think broadcasting, but in Europe that's not. Media and communications means media theory. And I studied psychodynamic media theory. So it's applying Freudian concepts to movies and television and cultural events and how the news functions and all this kind of stuff. It's a, it was a roundabout way of getting what I wanted to learn. So you can find this stuff. Check out this article this week and give you a fuller picture. Any questions or thoughts about psychoanalysis and Freud? Sorry, it's all I, the only other thing I would think is valuable. Remember this, ego, id, and superego. Freud never used these terms. They were translations by James Strachey to make it sound more scientific to American audiences. They're Latin. Freud used uber ick, the above me, the ick, the me, and the das es, the thing, and that was turned into it, ego, and superego for American scientific to make it more palatable to scientific thinkers. And the other big thing, Freud was a big integrator. If you want to think of the id, think biological psychology, what we study in biological drives. If you want to think of cognitive psychology, think ego psychology, how decisions are made, etc. And if you want to think about the, the superego, the superego is a good, oh, aren't I nice boy? The superego is a demanding tyrant on you. Should, 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 should not, should not, should not. That's social psychology, social influence. So Freud actually managed to take all these branches of psychology, academic psychology, cognitive psychology of thinking and decision making, social psychology of social pressures, and biological psychology and call those three separate aspects or those personalities or ego states within ourselves. And that's a very integrated model if you think about how wild what we do is. Okay, I hope I gave you a nice impression, impression of Freud and maybe not so easily cliche dismiss, dismissal of it. Something at least to look into. What's next week? Behaviorism? Not as exciting, but it'll be interesting. <laughs> Any questions or thoughts? Thanks for going over a couple of minutes. Thank you.